Okay, I hope that the slides are appearing properly. I was looking at the calendar and noticed that uh, by a really happy coincidence, this is the week of the feast of the Surpost Tarkmanchats. When we celebrate Nersa Shnorali together with Mesrop, Yereshe, Movsas Tavi, Gregory of Nadek. So it worked out really well that for the final presentation in this short series on the transition of the Armenian church into the diaspora and setting of Cilicia, Nersa Shnorali is our topic. I suspect that when we think of Nersas, we think of someone who's larger than life. There's a kind of a halo of unreality about him, or maybe super reality, something that's beyond our normal experience. And this is true as we think of many of the saints, I believe. Relatively few people remember the achievements of Nerses's brother, Krikor Katologos, who actually made Nerses's greatness possible. But Nerses himself is remembered everywhere. He's remembered in sculpture, in painting, in engraving. He's remembered on medals, on stamps and stickers. His works have appeared in multiple editions, numerous translations. His prayerful songs are sung daily. They bring hope to every funeral. They lend a kind of sober exaltation to every Lenten service. And the more that we learn about the Armenian faith and the scriptures on which it's based, the more our understanding of Nersus's beautiful words deepens and grows, and branches out. And we realize that we are in the presence of someone whose spirit and intellect, whose gifts and talents were entirely at the service of Christ and of the church. So it's interesting that Nersus did not experience himself as a man of inspired creativity or inspiring faith. At the end of his life, he saw himself pretty much as a failure. He was acutely aware of the ways in which he and even his creative talent had caused pain and suffering to others. He was very sensitive to the ways in which he failed his brother, things that we'll be talking about this evening. He went over and over in his mind the problems that he had not been able to overcome, the people he was unable to win over, the conflicts for which he found no resolution, the projects which he initiated that ended up going nowhere. And all of these things weighed on his heart for years. So this evening, I want to make an attempt to step at least partly into Nerses's reality as he saw it, as he often describes it very honestly, and as the details of his biography reveal it. We already know from last week that Nerses didn't have much scope for ch choice in his life, in how he spent his days. Although we have very few exact dates from his biography, we do know that he was in a monastic school already at a tender age. He was ordained at 17. He was a bishop by the time he was in his early 20s. His trajectory was shaped by the history of his family, by the death of his father, and by the life of his most loving and perhaps also indulgent older brother, Krikor. 
as is the case for all of us, the choices of other people, things that really had nothing directly to do with him, also created decisive moments or crossroads in Narcissus's life, the significance of which would only become fully obvious to him later. For example, his oldest brother, Vasil, and one of his sisters were married into the Hetumian clan of Lampron. Strange though it might seem that such close relatives of the Catoigos married into a clan that was Chalcedonian rather than Lusavurchagan. And strangely enough, in ways that he could never have foreseen, one of Nerses' greatest achievements and one of his greatest failures in his own eyes would come about because of those marriages. As in fact, would the birth of one of the Armenian church's most adventurous thinkers, Nerses' sister's son, Sumbat, whom he later named for himself when he was ordained. So the young man became Nerses of Lambron. There were other unexpected things that came from these marriages as well. When their brother Vazil was taken captive by a Muslim army, Nerses together with Krikor found himself the unexpected guardian of Vazil's son, who later took the ordination name of Krikor and would succeed Nerses as Katoigos. And there was no way that Nerses could have foreseen that this young nephew's personality would be instrumental in undoing some of what Nerses and his brother worked so hard to achieve. But this is life. <laughs> Many unexpected things with unexpected results, ramifications, influences. Be that as it may, just past the midpoint of his life, Nerses found himself confronted with new realities. A midlife crisis, if you like, that we would probably say was brought on at least partly by stress. There was the political stress of trying to figure out how to relate politically to the Franks, as the Crusaders were called in the Middle East, and to their European Catholic backers, the papacy, the Holy Roman Empire, various princes. A lot rode on the success of those relations. And so there was a great deal of pressure, I believe, on Nerses, as on his brother, to make them successful. Then there was also the stress, the trauma that came with the fall of the city of Edessa to the Muslim forces of Zengi. To say nothing of the subsequent decade of turmoil for the dense Armenian population in that area. <clears throat> Nerses wrote an epic about the loss of the city as he tried to process for himself and to help other people process the enormity of that tragedy. And of course the stress of that Edessan situation was compounded by the fact that he and his brother had to engineer the Catholic state's move from within the territory of Edessa to the fortress of Horomkla, which as we mentioned last time was sold to the Catholicos by the Armenian widow of the city's crusader prince, a woman named Beatrice. This is a very different kind of a location. Sitting in the middle of the Euphrates River, it's not an island, it's also not a mainland. And this is the second relocation, major relocation, 
that the brothers and their entire staff had to make. That by itself would be sufficiently stressful, but the fact that the Catholicoso Center established by Krikor Bagayasir at Garmir Vank, the place where they had grown up near Kesun, where they had studied and been nurtured, had not too long before burned to the ground. It must have made this second move even more poignant and painful. They couldn't go home again because home was no longer there. And Haromkla, no matter how you look at it, is a severe place. It's impregnable. It's forbidding. You're not sure where the rock ends and the building begins. You're not sure even that that matters in the ethos of this place. Haromkla is a very far cry from the kind of warm and welcoming church center that one would hope to be able to offer to the faithful. It was as safe as possible for the time. And it was also very, very isolated. Yes, Haromkla does have its beautiful moments. The way the sun plays on the waters of the Euphrates River in the summer. The waning of the light in the autumn. The way that the snow sits gently on all of its harsh stone in the winter. the return of greenery in the spring. And the riotous blooming fields of wild flowers all lent this unfriendly place, a stark kind of beauty now and then. But the best views of Haromkla are not from the peninsula itself. One has to be outside it to appreciate those things. Or one has to be above it. And Nerses was neither one of those things. He described Haromkla as a rocky prison, a secure cage that kept the Katoigo state alive, that kept the apparatus of the church safe, but that also cut the Katoigos off from the possibility of freely visiting and pastoring in person those communities for whose welfare he was responsible to God. It was sometime very shortly after the move to Haromkla that Nerses underwent a life-changing experience. <clears throat> he became ill, so ill that he nearly died. When he finally clawed his way back to health two years later, he was a changed man, according to his own account of things. A close call with death put things into perspective for him. I think it helped to lift him out of that maze of stressful, high pressure, things that were calling 
upon his energy, his time, and his mind. He began to devote more time to the faith formation of his nephews and to take his role with their in their lives much more seriously. In 1151, during his recovery time, he wrote a long and remarkable statement of faith for his nephew, Abirad. And in 1152, towards the end of his recovery, the beginning of his returning strength, he wrote his own personal faith confession that begins, Jesus Vorti, Jesus, son, referencing among other things, the cry of the blind man asking Jesus for healing. A statement of faith that was a kind of a companion piece to his youthful biography in verse that he entitled simply an epic history of Iba Sanutun devoted to an exploration of his Pahlavuni heritage. The things that he owed to the people of his past. So on the one hand, he began to take his responsibilities towards the younger members of his family more seriously. On the other hand, as he recovered, Nersas realized how very badly he had behaved towards his brother. As Katoigos Krikor had been very generous with Nerses. To the greatest extent possible, he had let Nerses pursue his writing and artistic interests, given him free range to follow his talents, to work on his personal issues, his spiritual life. But the cost to that had been that Krikor had let his own talents languish. And Nersus began to realize how much his brother had shielded him while he himself bore all the public burdens of the Katoi Goset and took the brunt of the relentless criticism against the Catholic Cossate and against Krikor himself personally. And yet Krikor had nursed Nerses back to health tenderly and without complaint, taking on himself Nerses's responsibilities as well as his own. This realization that Nerses had, the realization that he needed to support his brother more strongly, to be there for his brother as his brother had always been for him, was a timely realization. Because as Katoikos Krikor's age advanced and the weaknesses the diseases, the lowered energy that sometimes accompanies the golden years began to make themselves felt. Nerses was able to be there, always the younger brother, able to take on himself to be entrusted with more burdensome duties. The years after 1152, once Nerses regained his health, were very productive. Big ambitious building projects turned Harompla into a nest of churches and chapels, offices, a school, unrivaled scriptorium, and a workshop of liturgical arts. This gospel was produced in Haromkla in the momentous year of 1166. We'll be coming back to it in a moment. The first year 
of Nersus's Catholico State. A generation or a generation and a half after Nersus, the great Cilician manuscript painter, miniature painter, Toros Roslin, would set up his prestigious school and workshop in the Horomkla Scriptorium, which by that point was enjoying royal patronage. At Haromkala, Roslin and his apprentices and his colleagues produced some of the greatest examples of Cilician art. The most beautiful pieces of Armenian Christian art from any time, including this canon table, his first signed work, his portrait, of King Levon II and his wife, Geran. With some of their 16 children. And aside from royal portraits and royal manuscripts, Toros and his associates also produced luxurious and sophisticated, unusual illuminations. This one is of the Magi returning home from Bethlehem. And this famous nativity scene Jesus teaching from the boat on the Sea of Galilee. This incredible last judgment and a magnificent scene from the a gospel book now kept in Jerusalem showing the three youths in the fiery furnace from the book of Daniel. The foundation for this workshop was set by Nerses. Of this great building project, one can now begin to see the remains from the air, the outline of the buildings is coming into view again as the soil of centuries has gradually settled. It's possible to visit Haromkla. And there are a certain number of archaeological and recovery projects either underway or envisioned for the near future. So somewhere amid these massive complex ruins, Nersas edited translations of saints' lives, wrote his work on the cosmos, entitled On the Heavens and Their Order, for his great friend, the famous physician of the time, Mukhitar Herazi. Walking through these passageways, he and his brother conversed about how, how it would be possible, as he said, to care spiritually for those who were far away from them, both in terms of their physical location and in terms of their affection. Here's an illumination that shows Nersas and Mukhitar deep in conversation on scientific matters. In these same very full and productive years, Nerses also penned a work called In Praise of the Angels as a gift for his brother. 
These were good years. Years of creating warm relationships with the people who lived and worked around him in Haromkla. For example, for the night guards who patrolled the ramparts of the fortification, Nerses wrote the hymn that we still sing in the night service. Awake, O God, my glory, and I shall awaken. Zartik parkin. He wrote it so that the sound of secular songs would not be filling the air, <laughs> entering his own windows, but also so that that sound, that sacred and holy sound would float out across the still dark waters of the ancient river. and rise up to the stars, still more ancient than the river. Stars whose presence put all human stresses and ambitions, complaints, efforts, frustrations, and sufferings into perspective. They were wonderful years. And then in 1164, when Nerses was around 63 and his brother Krikor was in his early 70s, a feud erupted between their relatives in Lambron and the ambitious Prince Toros Rupenian, who planned to extend his own lands and power base by eliminating Lambron as a powerful clan center. This could wreak untold havoc in the area. It would create instability. It would open the way for foreign powers to step into the situation of the Armenians, which until then had been growing nicely. And so Krikor sent Nerses to mediate. related by marriage to both Oshin of Lambron and Toros Rupenian, but under the control of neither one. Nerses was well positioned to understand both sides and his rank in the church and his excellent reputation made him a trustworthy mediator. And it's interesting to see the man that we think of as the great Nerses Norali through the eyes of Oshin's 12-year-old son, Sambat, who writes in one of his works about how one evening his parents called him into the reception hall of the family in order to meet his extraordinary great uncle. And Sambat describes looking at his uncle and wondering what all the fuss was about. What he saw was a gray haired old guy, gray haired and full of days, he says. And just as no one else can foresee the future, neither could Sambat foresee that he would later become a priest bearing the name of that gray-haired old guy as he embarked on his brief career. Nerses Lampronazi packed a lot into his short life on earth. At the successful conclusion of these protracted, difficult talks, Nerses went to visit his niece's family at Lambron for a little rest and relaxation. Who knew when he would be able to get here again? Who knew when he would, if ever, enjoy the company 
of his relatives again. And it was during these days that he, observing young Simba, told his sister that that one, I want that one for the church. And then after this visit, Nersus was escorted south to Mamestia or Mamistra or Mapsavestia or Masis, whatever name we want to use for it, where the Byzantine Emperor Manuel's deputy, Alexius, was then in residence. Maybe Nersus was a little curious to see whether he could strike up a relationship with Alexius. And Alexius was certainly interested by the opportunity to have a real live Armenian hierarch available to question. And over a number of days, the two men got together multiple times for long discussions. Alexius asked Nerses to explain to him what the reason was for the division in the one church of Christ. And they debated, they discussed, they probed matters of doctrine, liturgical differences, amid other pleasant conversation and good food. And over those days, the two of them became quite friendly. They liked each other. And Alexius asked Nersus if he would please write for him a brief exposition of Armenian faith and practice so that he could show it to the emperor. So for an indefinite period of time after these interviews came to an end, which whetted Nerses's interest as well in exploring the possibilities for some kind of union perhaps between the Armenian and the Byzantine churches, something that he had not anticipated walking into the opportunity of. Nerses continued his stay at Lampron, wrote a statement of faith for Alexius, to give to Manuel. And then very happy with the unexpected opportunity that this presented and very pleased with the positive outcome of his mediation in the bitter family issue. And probably also well rested and refreshed. Nerses set out for home. As far as we know, this was one of only two trips he made outside the Catholicate. And who knows with what feelings he returned to the fortress on the river. But he had many stories to tell. He was anxious to see his brother to discuss what these new possibilities meant. But when he got back to Horomkla in the fall, Nerses found his brother much weaker than he had left him. His health had declined precipitously over the year that Nerses had been away. And Nerses was devastated. Why hadn't his brother called him back? Why hadn't his brother sent him news of his condition? He would certainly have returned much earlier than he did. He felt waves of guilt over having spent such pleasant time away such exciting time away while his brother was suffering. And the two of them faced the facts together. It was clear that Krikor could no longer fulfill his duties as Catholicos.
And so, as Krikor pointed out, it was time. Time for Nerses to step up to the plate completely. He had always resisted his older brother's past invitations to be consecrated as coadjutor catholicos. He much preferred to remain his brother's assistant. This time, it was clearly a different situation. Because if, actually it wasn't if, it was just when, and they both knew it, when Krikor died, the succession had to be clear and secure. The Armenian communities could not afford another interlude such as there had been at the beginning of Krikor's reign when a group of bishops in opposition to the young Katoigos as he had been in those days anointed David Tornikian of Achtamar as Katoigos in his place, creating a division, creating hard feelings, creating a second Katoigosate. So Nerses agreed very unwillingly. Unwilling because the thought of Krikor's Katoigosate coming to an end was not one he wanted to contemplate. But he agreed to the calling of a synod of bishops, vartabeds, and all monastics, which took some time to convene at which the weakened Katoigos informed all present of his decision to consecrate Nersas as coadjutor Katoigos. And with their unanimous approval, Nersas consented to accept Katoigosal consecration at his brother's hand. That must have made it somewhat better. <laughs> On April 17th, 1166, Palm Sunday. He was to continue as Krikor's official coadjutor for barely three months. The Heismavurk gives the date of Krikor's death as August 8, 1166. And so one of the first things that he did as Katoigos was to bury his brother in the flesh, but father in the spirit, as he called Krikor in a place of honor next to the church that Krikor had built in Haronkla. No matter how Christian he was, <laughs> no matter how philosophically inclined he might have been, or how spiritually mature, it was a difficult, difficult day. After 64 years together, Nersas was left alone, both spiritually and in terms of his office. And he felt it deeply. Krikor, in all the burdens of his Catholic say, had had a brother. to sustain and assist him, not so much at first perhaps, but in the later years, absolutely. Nerses, on the other hand, facing the same burdens and greater, had no one by his side. Krikor, when he became Katoigos, had been in the first flush of his youth, full of energy, 
dreams. As Nerses wrote later, thanks to his early career, Krikor would be remembered as pure in soul, wise in word, in written composition, in study, in knowledge, and most of all, astute in counsel. People had spoken of Krikor as the little Vagayaseir. For his many translations, and Nerses knew them well, he edited them. Although only a few hymns have come down to us under Krikor's name. As the historian Samuel Anetsi put it, Krikor was gloriously respected not only by our own people, but by foreign kings and princes, especially by the kings and patriarchs of the Romans, who together with his impressive and handsome physical appearance, recognized the beauty of his soul and the truth in his declarations of faith. Grigor had left behind a good reputation a goodly record of achievement in spite of his many critics. Nerses, on the other hand, when he became Katoigos, was already in the grip of old age. He felt that he had far fewer physical resources than he would have had earlier. And he had a waning reserve of energy to meet ever growing challenges. And he had to wonder, what would he be remembered for? And he couldn't help but think a little bitterly, and he wrote about it later, that by rights, he should have been the one who died first, 15 years earlier, when he had been at death's door, he should have just stepped through to the other side. Better that than to have been thrust onto a lonely seat wrapped, as he said, only in the last shreds of his humanity. Now, of course, Nerses was depressed when he wrote those lines. We should say he was not actually physically alone in his last years, spiritually abandoned. Although there's no doubt at all that he felt that way in the months and years after Krikor's death. Writing in his famous general epistle, his Antanragan Tucht, in which he spread the news of his brother's passing officially to the churches. Nerses tried to lay out some of his own vision, their shared vision for how Christian living on the part of all social classes would secure the future of the Armenians in their many and various hostile environments. And so after a long section on his brother's qualities, on his own weakness, on his own feelings of inadequacy to face this new calling. Nersus began his letter in a way that we might not find natural. He began his letter with admonitions to monks and bishops about how they should behave and about the things that they were doing, which in his view were not only unbecoming of their orders, but were actually dangerous to the spiritual welfare of the nation. In his view, if monks and bishops failed to live out their faith, in an exemplary and self-sacrificing way, it would cause, had caused, he could see it around him, a cascade of disruptions and tragedy 
in the life of the nation. After addressing words to them, he worked his way down the list of offenses to be avoided, going through the categories of society in order of their, the damage that they could do to society, the damage that in his opinion, they were already doing to society. And so he spoke to parish clergy, then to secular government officials, then to the military, then to merchants, then to people who lived in cities, then to people who worked the land, laying out for each one what it would mean for them to contribute to the welfare of the world simply by their Christian behavior. Lastly, and least in the list of potential offenders, and thus one assumes the most consistently positive group in society, were women for whom he has almost no words of disapprobation. It was probably a bittersweet day when in 1167, around the time that this general epistle went out, Nerses received a letter from the Byzantine Patriarchate and the Imperial Court addressed to his brother. As he read the letter, it was filled with praises of Krikor and his achievements, his character and his faith. The letter expressed the Byzantine emperor's eager desire to pursue a relationship between the two churches, to carry on real negotiations for the unity of the two. It was the fruit of Nerses's conversations as he had lingered in Mamestia and then at Lampron before returning to those sad last days of Krikor at Haromkla. So on the one hand, there was the joy of the tree that he had planted bearing fruit. And on the other hand, the sadness that his brother was not there to enjoy it with him. So as their correspondence went on, the correspondence between Emperor Manuel and Catoigos Nerses, Nerses held official debates between the Byzantines and the Armenians. He chaired them in 1170 in company with his nephew, Krikor Dara, who by then was a bishop. And actually, even though he retained the name Dara, he was nearly 40 years old at the time. Together with them was John, the Syrian Bishop of Kesun, two other bishops named Petros and Sahak, a Bartabet named Vertanes. And they went from stage to stage in these negotiations with more and more optimism for what the future might hold. Nerses's letters to Manuel were very frank. They called upon the emperor if he was serious about brotherly love between the Armenians and the Byzantines, then one of the things he would need to address was the attitude of average Byzantines towards their Armenian brothers. Attitudes which were far less respectful than one would normally have with an enemy. In those negotiations, Nerses was not alone, nor was he alone in administration. The historian Vartan says that Nerses ordained seven bishops described as famous and choice men to be his colleagues in the work of running the church. And so for the next seven years, 
the length of his katoigos eight years when most people would be living out their retirement. Katoigos Nersas the fourth Kalayatsi did what he could to watch over those who were distant from him, both geographically and in terms of their love. The relentless barrage of criticism that had followed everything Krikor did now focused itself on him. And having watched his brother's grace under fire, having mellowed and matured in his own spirit, Nerses accepted the criticism with good grace and even with some humor. <laughs> we have several quite terrible letters worthy of any modern troll that were written to him by one of his own clergy, accusing him of all kinds of mismanagement. <laughs> and in his response, before politely saying that this is the only time he was going to respond to this correspondent, he would not answer a second letter should there be one. The Katoigos wrote, you are so right in your estimation, your poor estimation of my character. And in fact, the situation is actually much worse than you can imagine, my dear brother. You have no idea how truly manifold are my sins. Pray for me and I will continue to pray for you. Nerses Lampronazi describes a visit that was paid to the Katoigoset by one of Nerses' critics, a moment at which he himself was present. And he describes how the Katoigos, when this man who couldn't stand him was ushered into the room and they were about to spend <laughs> however long a time with Nerses patiently listening to the man's complaints. Nerses seeing him walk through the door rose to his feet, went quickly over to him, hugged him, said how glad he was to see him and himself brought him back to sit down across from him as friend to friend. One thing that Nerses could not do was he could not bring himself to finish the commentary on Matthew's gospel that he had begun as a gift for his brother before Krikor's death. When Krikor died, he put it in a drawer and left it. He had just finished commenting on the Sermon on the Mount. Later, someone else would carry it beyond Matthew 5, doing his best to finish the work respectfully and in line with Nerses's own thinking. But there were other things he could and did do. Inspired by Nerses the Great for whom he was named, Shnorhali pursued char charitable activities. Times were very hard and people in the area needed to know that every Friday, money and food and other necessities would be distributed by the Katoigos and his associates, no questions asked, other than, what do you need, my friend? And even that, the open door with the long lines of people coming for help was not enough. Nerses realized that there would be people who were either too proud or too ashamed to come to his open door and ask. And so Nerses regularly sent out his students and deacons into the nearby settlements. And while it looked like they were having a friendly drink or a dinner, they were actually 
keeping their ears and eyes open for anything that they could hear about such people. People who were suffering silently rather than admit their difficulty. And they would bring the news back to the Catoigos so that without fanfare, whatever those people needed could then mysteriously materialize at their door. Nerses also took to calling everyone Luis or Achatzas Luis, calling people light or light of my eyes. In part because he met so many people, it would have been impossible to remember their names and he didn't want anyone to feel forgotten, but also in part because he saw them all that way. He saw within them the light with which they had been created and he loved them all, including, and perhaps especially, his enemies and his detractors. In the end, right before the council that would have clinched the deal with the Byzantines, Nerses' death prevented him from seeing those ecumenical talks for which he had worked so hard through to a positive conclusion. And later the death of the emperor and the patriarch were going to bring to power in Byzantium people who were not interested in such a project. So Nerses' hopes for a fraternal and mutually respectful union between the Armenian and Byzantine churches were not realized. And even though his successors would continue to pursue the possibilities with Rome, those talks too would prove unsuccessful. Major accomplishments that didn't happen. So from his point of view, really the only thing that Nerses could look back on with satisfaction at the end of his life was his success in bringing into the church converts from heretical groups in the area who called themselves Arevortik, who are described generally as following a combination of Zoroastrian and Christian teaching of some kind. Alnerses was also proud of his nephew, Krikor de Ra. He was proud of the bishops that he had ordained and of his promising young great-nephew Nerses of Lambron. I would like to think that perhaps his music brought him some joy as well. Nerses Shnorali died in August 1173, almost seven years exactly after his accession to his brother's throne. And according to the young Nerses Lamparanazi who delivered his eulogy in verse, <laughs> even though he recognized that his poetic talent was in no way equal to Shnorhali's own, he still felt that he wanted to do that. According to this eulogy, the Catoigos had been worn down by the effects of his ascetic lifestyle the cares of his office, and he had succumbed to a recurrence of his earlier physical illness during the extreme heat of that summer. Nerses's successor and nephew, Krikordoa, took it upon himself to build Nerses a grand tomb near that of his brother. They were once again side by side, together in death as they had been throughout life. 